Hi, I'm Dinah Arnett. I'm a producer at Tampa Bay Community Network. I have a very interesting show for you today. What we're going to see, and we're going to meet Professor Kelly Reynolds. He's been a professor here in Tampa at the University of South Florida for many years. But now he goes on the road doing a one-man show representing Henry Bradley Plant during the heyday of Florida's growth. Now remember, Henry Plant was responsible for the Florida Hotel, which now houses our beautiful University of Tampa. So join me, let's meet Professor Kelly Reynolds as Henry Bradley Plant, and let's enjoy this wonderful documentary. Ladies and gentlemen, young people of all ages, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Henry Bradley Plant. And for those of you who decide to say goodbye to old man winter up in the old hometown, and you come to the most southern part of our country, <laughs> to Florida, I should be one of the first to say welcome. Cause without me, you wouldn't have this big rich state with all its beaches and palm trees and sunsets and marinas. Oh, and all the houses and homes and farms and groves and ranches and 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 the stores and businesses that you do today. Oh, and also today, according to some of the things Professor Reynolds told me on the way over here, parking lots and theme parks and high-rise condominiums and, 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 and shopping center malls, whatever they may be. Well, on this map, you see where my railroads ran and my steamboats. Without my many black lines on the map, you would not have the big cities and resort centers in Florida that you do today. No, nor have so many are swell smaller cities and communities. Why, without the advances in transportation made possible by the investment opportunities of the plant system, which became the Atlantic Coastline, the CSX, the P&O Steamship Line, and the Railway Express Agency, the people of Florida might still be riding their back roads in horse-drawn vehicles, and your children might still be attending class in the traditional one-room schoolhouse. And you can take me for a pretty good judge in these matters, because I was born before the age of steam in the year 1819, and I am the product of an education in a one-room schoolhouse in Branford, Connecticut, just outside New Haven. As tis, whenever Professor Reynolds talks me into another ride in his time machine, and I come back to these central and west coast regions of Florida around, oh, Fort Myers and Arcadia and Ocala and St. Petersburg and Tam Just about here, folks all over saying thank you. Thank you, Mr. Plant, for all your railroads did to fill our stores with merchandise, to bring us good jobs and to make us prosperous and successful. Oh, and speaking of prosperity and success, the last time I saw Tampa in the year 1899, <laughs> yes, that was the year I received a summons to a higher calling. Up above, <laughs> well, by 1899 you had begun to show some signs of progress here. Tell me, I haven't had a chance to go outside lately. Did you ever become a big city like I promised you would? <laughs> I sure hope so. Next. Let's have a show of hands on this out there. How many of you have ever been to Orlando? What? I'm amazed. Back during my first years in Florida, hardly anybody ever heard of Orlando outside the village limits. High speed efficient transportation would change all that and here you see beautiful downtown Orlando about 100 years ago, right after we put up the big new depot. But <laughs> these days, after another century of ever accelerating progress, you may not realize it, but you got the enjoyment and benefits of comforts that I had to do all the hard work of. <laughs> Becoming a millionaire to enjoy and pass on. That's right. In my day, only a millionaire could enjoy the luxury of a bathroom, such as each one of you has the opportunity to take a bath or shower in every day, the minute you want to. When I was young, only dreamers could imagine the luxury of a bathroom. I was a grown man before indoor plumbing was begun to be invented. When I was a lad, 
we heated our water on a stove and we had to fetch our water in in order to operate the modern conveniences of the time such as the trusty hand crank washing machine, the new streamlined scrub board and the high tech new clothespin. Of course uh, here in Florida when you took a bucket to the well outside and back, well that could be a dangerous operation. Human progress, though, you know, has always worked best on the reward system. And here you behold a youthful record of myself during the early years of success in our great southern region when I could begin to enjoy the rewards of my labor in my favorite chosen way. Oh, but you know, when I first came to Florida, I'd have been happy to give each one of you a million dollars for the life you have today. Let's see how many we are out there. Hmm, quite a few. Well. I could about afford that in today's currency. In my time, though, when you worked as hard as I did to make money, you might not be called a millionaire. Oh, no. In my day, in some quarters, if you were a successful, in my day, if you were a successful young businessman and had begun to make some real money for yourself and buy some fancy clothes, and everybody could tell that you were rich and getting richer every day, every minute, and all the time they were poor and getting poorer every day, every minute. And why do you suppose that was? They were getting poorer because you were getting richer. Well, not everybody liked it. They could call you some nasty names, as happened to my erstwhile competitor here, Mr. Diamond Jim Fisk who managed to get his hands on any number of what could have been successful railroads without doing a lick of real work. Well, they call such successful businessmen as Diamond Jim robber barons. Oh, we all know what a robber is, but what is a robber baron? What is a baron? A baron is almost a king. Back in the days of the knights in shining armor, there were some of these barons would take advantage of you and rob you every time you had to travel across their territory or stay in their castle. In my day, there were some successful businessmen who would take advantage of you and rob you every time you had to walk in their store or ride on their railroad. <laughs> this is that Jesse James of corporate finance from the Western Reserve Territory, Mr. John D. Rockefeller. And this is Mr. J.P. Thorpe Morgan of the House of Morgan. Oh, what was the House of Morgan, you may well ask? Well, just listen to this. In 1893, J. Pierpoint Morgan and his partners created the vast Southern Railroad Company by issuing $120 million worth of shares unto themselves that nobody ever paid for in what has gone down the books of financial history as the classic example of stock jobbing and watering. Oh, and while we're on the subject, did you ever hear about a fellow named Henry Flagler for one? Oh boy, when you're in the market for a robber baron, this is the real item, <laughs> yes sir. And here we catch a glimpse of Henry in his later years when he had mellowed some. Doesn't he look sweet? Don't let it fool you, though. Might have been some pretty big conflicts between our interests, but as soon as we could sit down and come to an arrangement about who belonged where, we managed to get along neighborly. Over on the East Coast, in between St. Augustine and Key West, Henry run a pretty good business in hotels and railroads off the money he brought down from Standard Oil. On to, on to the hand, when you just worked hard, took some well thought out chances with your money and got rich? What was that? It's what we're supposed to do in this country the way I always understood it, though to make a small exception. With respect to financial investments, personally, I have always looked on a well thought out chance as something more like a well thought out opportunity. And when hard work well done is the source of your joy in life, even if that were not the way to make money, then what? Cause finishing up a job and a certain knowledge that no one could do it better if swabbing down the decks on a passenger boat, which was a career I took up at an early age in preference to my grandmother's offer to send me to Yale University, and soon from swabbing down the decks 
to manager of the freight department on the entire steamship line. Well, money comes only after that satisfaction and is a small thing compared to it, I can honestly tell you. Let me give you an idea how this simple philosophy can rebound to everybody's benefit. After the Civil War, myself and a group of friends and associates, the father of the child who would grow up to be Franklin Delano Roosevelt among them, began the development of railroads throughout the South by taking some, <laughs> by taking some calculated opportunities with our money. I had developed a degree of expertise during those tragic years of the Civil War and my friends and associates relied entirely on my judgment. I can recall what uh, the Savannah Morning News had to say about it in their edition of about July 18, 1872. Mr. Plant and his friends have money to invest. When they decide on a certain thing to do, build a piece of railroad for instance, they figure out what each one is to pay and send in their checks for that amount. They have no bonds, no indebtedness, no interest to pay. They build railroads to operate them. Ho, 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 my friends, here you have the whole secret of the plant investment company, if there ever was one. They build railroads to operate them. In other words, we based our success not on squeezing the company to make a profit or finagling the company to make a profit, but on running the company to make a profit. In this case, very appropriately, a railroad. Know your business, take care of your business, stick to your business. Give your business your best day's work every minute you're needed on the job. Then all concern will profit, the investors and public alike. Otherwise, well, we all know the sad story of what could have been a sound business except for faint-heartedness and lack of savvy. The value of such a business declines until someone with a little money to risk on making the right improvements can step in. And folks, shall we just briefly consider this development? What you see here is the same street corner in downtown, guess where? Miami, before and after the arrival of my friend Henry Flagler with his railroad. If you consider the way business is done in America and compare it with the way it has been done the rest of the world, you'll recognize that taking advantage of such opportunities is what makes the American businessman, the American businessman, as right here in this fine example of my colleague in the steamship business, Mr. Mark Hanna of Fast Grow in Cleveland, Ohio, in the Western Reserve Territory of the state of Connecticut, the destination for many an ambitious young New England businessman. And here is Cleveland, Ohio in the days of my young manhood, where you behold fame millionaires row on Euclid Avenue, the neighborhood of John David Rockefeller and Henry Morrison Flagler. So, in comparison to all that, what do you suppose there could be about the well-known inhospitable territory of the barely settled state of Florida as might tempt an ambitious young New England businessman such as myself to wander down this way? Well, between 1860 and 1880, the population had increased 90% to something amounting to a quarter million rugged souls very rugged souls to inhabit the entire peninsula. Still, not terribly promising. Then, following the hard-fought election of the year 1876, Governor George F. Drew had this to say in his inauguration address. That government will be the most highly esteemed which provides the greatest benefit to individual and industrial enterprises at the least expense to the taxpayer. <laughs> Words to remember. <laughs> Words that the opportunity taker loves to hear over and over. That government will be the most highly esteemed, which provides the greatest benefit to individual and industrial enterprises at the least expense to the taxpayer. Consequently, we know about the year 1882. I came upon a little place called Tampa, Florida, slumbering away as it had been for years. It seemed to me that all South Florida needed for a successful future was a little spirit and 
energy, which could be fostered by transportation facilities. At this particular time, however, matters in the Tampa Bay region were going from poorly to lots worse. Some folks with mm, limited experience in railroad operations were about this close to miss the deadline on their extension to Tampa, with the eventuality of any amount of sorry consequences up and down the line. Fortunately, we had the resources to come to their rescue. Now, let me acknowledge, this was not altogether an act of altruism on our part. The undertaking to complete a piece of railroad on schedule had proved so formidable that our state and federal governments would reward successful railroad construction with large land grants along the right of way. The land grants along the right of way to Tampa were particularly generous and desirable. I calculated that with expert hard work we might still beat the deadline, and so we did. <laughs> Oh, it may be true what some folks say, that for business ventures I have the clairvoyant eye. In the decade previous to beating the deadline, the population in Tampa had declined 10%. In the following decade, it increased by, what would you say, a similar amount, 10%? That would be barely satisfactory in my opinion. How about, pretty good, but not good enough, 50%? Well, 100%. The population doubled. That would be more like it. Yet, possibly still more. How many opportunity takers will go any higher? To have the clairvoyant eye for business? My friends, the population increased to 1,000%. By 1886, you could ride from New York to Tampa without changing cars. By that time, too, the port of Tampa had been well established, and I began a steamship line with connections to Key West and Havana. So you see, almost overnight, thanks to hard work <laughs> and some calculated opportunities, Tampa had grown from a sleepy backwater fishing village to a vital link in our nation's commerce. Yes, sir. Banana handler for the nation. Still, vital link won't hardly give you the idea what I had in mind for Tampa's growth, because my friends, this idea was glorious. Indeed, so much more glorious because the Florida back then that I put my money into and my hard work and my risk-taking calculations was scarcely the paradise we have been living in ever since, and largely as a result of the foregoing. Oh, the story has been put around that the paradise was already here. Well, yes, maybe so for bobcats and gators and chiggers and mosquitoes and water moccasins and taking the family out in a picnic out amongst the Spanish bayonets and sand spurs and, 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 and quicksand can give rise to a few complaints. In fact, the basic conditions for human life here were so hard that very few big money investors of the time were willing to risk anything in Florida. Who else was there, really, besides me and Flagler? For example, I can well remember what one of our colleagues who stayed up north with his money, the Boston Railroad man Samuel Sloan, had to say about the situation. I do not want to criticize these undertakings, but I do say that it would be impossible for a group of capitalists to build railroads and make these other developments in what I take to be a worthless country. Save its climate. Save its climate. Well then, what else would there be, said a horse-drawn commerce on backwoods roads and overnight accommodations to challenge the hardihood of a, of a, of a veteran soldier? steamboats and first-class excursion trains with destinations to luxury hotels. Indeed, this combination of steamboats, excursion trains, and luxury hotels would provide the secret opportunity known as tourist, which so many potential investors of the time simply could not recognize. Oh, but for those of us who did, and for those of us who still do recognize opportunity, Lake Buena Vista in the virgin wilderness, we have seen and we still see a whole new way of life being created overnight. 
Sounds like we're talking about the opening of a frontier, doesn't it? Like the building of a civilization. Well, that's what it was. So you begin to appreciate now, don't you, my friends, when you go back in time and you contemplate that inhospitable territory, that worthless country, that sleepy backwater fishing village? And then you fix your mind on the year 1891 and you envision the sudden, not to say miraculous appearance in all its pristine splendor and glory of the Tampa Bay Hotel. The first of the two great luxury hotels I built in the Tampa Bay region, the other being the Bellevue Resort in Clearwater. Yes, steamboats, excursion trains, luxury hotels, venture capital, adventure capital. So, you may well ask me today when you can take such things for granted, why the particular importance of luxury hotels? Well, a gigantic edifice of costly materials designed and executed, sparing no expense, calls on decorations of a like value to fill it. In my second wife, Margaret. Oh, Margaret. I was blessed with a partner who could recognize decorations above all for their cultural value. Together, we dreamed of creating not just a luxury hotel second to none, but an outpost and sanctuary for culture, which would in turn attract more. Consider how a community develops. Where the capitalist has ventured successfully, as in the creation of a vital link for our nation's commerce, paychecks multiply, jobs become permanent and generational, and this will attract other activities in such traditional fields as manufacturing, merchandise, and real estate, Oh, and not to forget agriculture. Folks, during my lifetime, 70% of our people were on the land. The success of the Flagler and Plant System Railroads depended on attracting communities of farmers. This would account first for the sale of the right-of-way land and subsequently for traffic and crops and equipment. Of course, you know our most desirable agricultural land in Florida has always been orange grove land, and despite the trouble we had down through the years on account of pests and freezes, and, and lately from what someone up in Mount Dora told Professor Reynolds, imported products, our wealthy harvest from orange trees continues to this day. Now, since we've been talking about orange groves and excursion trains, here's a couple of the treasures Professor Reynolds recently discovered on his uh, prowls through the photo archives of our nation. This first shows the most popular idea we ever had for the excursion trains we ran on the plant system, taking passengers out to the grove where you could pick your own fruit. This was just outside Bartow. And here, we behold the sleek and mighty engine we call the Santilla, the first of the big wood-burning locomotives we ran on the Savannah, Florida, and Western Line, a product of the Baldwin Locomotive Works in Philadelphia. And I am pleased to tell you that skilled workers at Mr. Henry Ford's Rouge River plant has restored the Santilla in mint condition to just uh, as it was when she came down here to Florida and Georgia. Well, and the Santilla, incidentally, presently occupies pride of place in Mr. Ford's Transportation Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. Meanwhile, whatever happened to that struggling, hard-pressed little community on Tampa Bay? Well, your sleepy backwater fishing village has become a big city a municipality. There must be municipal schools, churches, hospitals, government. Of course, you know there are many big cities, but few great ones. For your great city, you have got to have culture. And remember, we're talking about a city that starts up suddenly, that hadn't got centuries and centuries to wait around for culture to happen to it, the, the way places in Europe got their culture. Well, I'll be frank with you. You need to import your culture. That's right. Bring her in from someplace else and maybe several different kinds of her too as long as you're on the job to make sure you got the best. What does this culture add up to anyway? Oh, I'm not sure. I can buy it. 
<laughs> oh, and my wife sure can. But I leave the deep thinking up to the college professors. Now, according to Professor Reynolds, it was that Shakespeare among modern authors, Mr. Charles Dickens, who bestowed on our culture the worthy and worldwide title of the Victorian Age. But in my time, it was that well-known teller of tall tales, Mr. Mark Twain, who bestowed on the culture I lent my fair share to the much less dignified title of the Gilded Age. By this, it's meant that our culture was a little bit overdone, <laughs> to say the least. But so I always say, when you got the money to spend and you start out from pert near nothing, why look cheap? So, does that help explain the inestimable value of an outpost and sanctuary of culture set down in the year 1891 in what was still the wilderness village of Tampa, Florida? An outpost and, sanct an outpost and sanctuary of culture that people could live in. A place of culture that people do not live in is called a museum. But a place of culture for people to live in where they could spend the day with culture all around them, in this case one of my prime favorite forms of culture, the game of golf, then sleep with next to in their own room at night and wake up beside in the morning and have breakfast with. That place was called the Tampa Bay Hotel. Has there ever been another such place for living with culture? Oh, naturally Margaret and I knew that in order to make Tampa, a place where people would leave their money behind in Florida, that we'd have to make our little overnight stay a fashionable success. And here, you got to give the credit to Henry, cause his Ponce de Leon, over in St. Augustine, was the first fashionable hotel address in Florida. Oh, now, don't let me give you the idea that these high fashions were only for the rich and famous. Oh, no. You'll notice that our earliest arrivals in Florida wasted no time in looking their very best. Why, we wore our most elegant clothes to sporting events and to participate in sporting events. We even wore our Sunday best on an afternoon excursion to a phosphate mine. Sadly, fashions change, and in the words of the old, old song, the fashions of the Gilded Age must, like the golden lads and lasses, like chimney sweepers, turn to dust. Though to my mind, human beings in public have never looked better, never looked grander. The Bay Hotel is now the main building of the University of Tampa and home to the Henry B. Plant Museum. Oh, and I am glad and proud to tell you that my Bellevue Resort Hotel, the Great White Lady of the Gulf, is now among... Well, folks, the allotment they give me for these visitations is about up. And I must bid you adieu. Right now, Professor Reynolds is waiting, <laughs> nervously, to take me outside and show me around. He has warned me not to expect to recognize very much, if anything, on account of the major improvements that have been put in place since my day, and especially the big changes that you have been a part of. Well, frankly, that's just what I do expect and hope for, to be deafened and dazzled by changes and improvements, because that's what my life here was all about, the making of a brand new Tampa. And doing so caused a whole lot of noise and raised a whole lot of dust. If you have done the same, made your own noise and raised your own dust, and created your own brand new Tampa, then the spirit of my changes and improvements will still be marching on, and I'll feel right at home.